my water just broke. I felt like things really intensified. She was right there and she was coming. It was, it was an amazing feeling. I'm gonna cry just thinking about it. I could feel her head. We heard her cry. We were squeezing hands and she was screaming. <laughs> I'm Bryn Hunt Palmer and you're listening to The Birth Hour. This podcast is designed as a safe place to come together and share childbirth stories. Stick around and join us to hear informative and empowering birth journeys from all over the world. Today's episode is sponsored by Aeroflow Breast Pumps. Aeroflow has helped millions of new and expecting parents discover the breastfeeding and postpartum essentials covered by their insurance, including breast pumps, maternity compression, and lactation education and support. They take care of everything, including all paperwork, working with your insurance company, and explaining your options to get these free essentials. Aeroflow offers all major breast pump brands, including Medela, Spectra, Motif, Lansano, Amida, LV, Willow, and more. All you have to do is go to aeroflowbreastpumps.com slash birth hour and fill out their free and easy qualify through insurance form. Extra bonus, if you use the coupon code birthhour15 in their online shop, you'll get 15% off all supplies and accessories. Head over to aeroflowbreastpumps.com slash birth hour to get started. At the end of this episode, I talk with Kate, not only about getting her breast pump for free through Aeroflow, but also about taking advantage of their online lactation classes. So stay tuned for that conversation. Before we get to today's birth story, I want to talk a little bit about our online childbirth course. It's called Know Your Options, and this is the course you've been looking for if you just have that gut feeling that you know you should be taking a childbirth course, but maybe the one that's being offered to you by your care provider is not exactly what you're looking for. It might be more catered towards the type of birth they want you to have versus making you informed of all your different options and how to address different things that happen in birth, because as this podcast has shown us, birth is very unpredictable. So we would love to have you check out our 12 module course. You can go to the birthhour.com slash course to see detailed outlines of what is included in the course. You will also get a bonus course called beyond the first latch. That is an additional six modules all about pumping, feeding your baby, going back to paid work. If that's part of your plan And we have a special coupon code for you. It's 100OFF for $100 off enrollment. Again, that's the birthhour.com slash course. And last thing before we get to the episode, we also want to share that we have a Patreon page. This has been going for about seven years now, and it's a place where you can support the birth hour, but you get fun perks in return, like access to over 600 additional birth stories that are not in your main podcast feed. And of course, membership in our private Facebook group at the $5 a month or more level. This is the best place on the internet. You hear people talk about it a lot on the podcast. It's a great place to get support, find friendship, get questions answered, and connect over our love of birth stories. So check that out at patreon.com slash birth hour. While I am home from the hospital, if you missed the drama, I had appendicitis, had my appendix removed, it had ruptured, and they sent me home a few days later, and then I got a post-op infection and was readmitted for four or five days. I don't even know anymore, but I got home on Monday and I've been resting. I was able to record two episodes today, which felt great. I'm still really tired and resting a lot, but so appreciative of everyone's support and my husband helping me out when I just could not get on the computer. Um, And I have one more rebroadcast for you guys today. This is an episode from 2018 with Desiree, and she talks about having a really peaceful cesarean birth experience. I've heard from a lot of you guys that you've actually really been enjoying these rebroadcasts, and I just want to remind you that that is one of the big perks of being a Patreon member is you can access hundreds and hundreds of episodes from our archives. So be sure to check that out if you want more of these stories. All right, let's get to today's episode. Hi, Desiree. Welcome to the birth hour. Thanks for coming on the show today. Thank you so much for having me. Can you start by telling listeners just a little bit about you and your family? I am 32 years old, uh, living in Brooklyn with my nine-month-old baby and husband. We, you know, do the normal nine-to-five thing and drop our baby off at daycare. We have two dogs, and we have a pretty active household. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, (laughs) All right. Well, why don't we start with finding out you were pregnant and then how your pregnancy went? So my husband and I had been trying, not for very long, about maybe three months back in August of 
I guess it would be 2016. And then we went away for a trip for Labor Day weekend. And I wasn't coming up as pregnant when we left. So I said, whatever, I'll just figure it out when we get back. Um, And lo and behold, that Monday of Labor Day, I took a pregnancy test and I was pregnant. Um, So it was pretty exciting Um, for us. My husband was ready to have a baby, I think, maybe two days after we met. Um, (laughs) And we were together for close to seven years before we got pregnant. So he was beyond thrilled. Um, So it was really, really exciting for us. So what were some of the first symptoms you started to have? We started off just, you know, with the normal kind of, you know, cramping symptoms, all that stuff. Um, And then... I'd say probably around six weeks, um, I just, we wanted to tell our families and we were in Chicago and my, my, I'm originally from Michigan. Um, so we were in Chicago for a wedding and my family came down and we announced at dinner and right after that, I think the next morning was the first time I ever threw up. And then from there, it just kind of snowballed, um, into its own crazy thing. (laughs) So at what point did you feel like this is more than just the normal morning sickness? Um, So we, you know, I got to, I went to Michigan to spend a week with my parents and I thought that I had just the worst flu that I'd ever had. I couldn't keep anything down, um, but it wasn't feverish, nothing else. I didn't have any other symptoms. I was just throwing up a lot. I felt weak and really dehydrated. And I was concerned because I was newly pregnant. Is this going to cause, you know, a miscarriage or something? Um, so I called my friend who lived in town who was a nurse. And she said that if you're having these kind of symptoms, you need to at least go into the hospital to make sure that they can rehydrate you via IV. So I did that. And everyone at the hospital was just like, yep, this is a normal part of pregnancy. Don't worry about it. It'll probably fade out and you know, another six weeks by the time you get through the first trimester. And we went along like that was true. I had my first ultrasound, um, confirmed the pregnancy with my doctor and was still just couldn't get a handle on it. Um, They gave me diclegis to start, hoping that that would take the edge off. And it, I felt like it made it worse. Um, I was just, I was a mess. Um, And I took a couple of days off from work just to kind of recenter myself and hopefully get over the hump. And it didn't matter what I did, nothing worked. So I was at one point, I think I was around probably at the seven to eight week mark, I was going into urgent care every other day. They knew my name. Um, We would just go in, they would have an IV bag ready. We would call ahead of time and I would just get rehydrated there and get a dose of either Reglan or Zofarin directly through the IV. And then I would leave. And that's what we did for a couple of days until I was on the train one time and I just had a complete breakdown and was sobbing. And I didn't have to get helped off the train, but basically everything close to that. So I called my doctor at the time and she said, I want to hospitalize you and monitor you. And at that point I went from, let's see, I think I was from eight weeks. So from seven weeks to 10 weeks, I dropped 25 pounds because of how much I was vomiting. I couldn't keep anything down. I was beyond miserable. And, you know, they were talking about really severe interventions and possibly this pregnancy not lasting. So they hospitalized me, what I thought was just going to be an overnight stay. And I ended up staying for three days. And after that, they said, everything seems fine. You're just going to check up with your doctor and off you go. And we were driving back from, this is not really funny, but I, you have to laugh to keep from crying sometimes. But uh, we were driving back from the hospital and I started throwing up in the car and I was just, mm-hmm. bit just never bawling. ending. I'm like, oh my gosh, anything. They'd given me these, you know, some Zofrin pills, like you'll be fine, you know, get out of here, enjoy your pregnancy. And I'm puking up the entire ride home. And my husband at that point was, uh, you know, becoming desperate himself. Like, what is going on with my wife? Is everything okay? Like, is everything okay with the baby? And our doctor at the time was, I mean, pretty, I would say pretty flippant about it. She was like, this is part of pregnancy. And even though you've got it a little bit severe, you're fine. 
and kind of you just need to get over it. And I really couldn't because I couldn't function at all. So that was when that was sort of the turning point for us when I had the long term hospitalization and when we left and I couldn't I still wasn't keeping it together. How was everything going with your job at that point? Uh, um, it was challenging. Yeah. Um, I was, I'm a manager, so I have people underneath me, um, who I train and then kind of send off into the world. Um, I wasn't really able to do anything. If I was in the office, I was just trying to make it to the bathroom and enough time to not embarrass myself. Um, and I had told, I told everyone, I think at about eight weeks, which was really early. And I didn't really feel comfortable saying anything, but because I just couldn't be in the office, I felt like they should have a reason as to why. And they were incredibly understanding, um, during the time they really, you know, made every, you know, accommodation for me, but I was just non-functioning at that point. And I ended up going on disability, I think around 12 weeks and I spent five weeks on disability which was pretty demoralizing (laughs) and, you know, just tough to go from just a normal, active, you know, healthy person to being on disability. It was, it was pretty, you know, tough to take. Yeah. I wish they had a different name for it with pregnancy. (laughs) Cause even when you're just like on trying to extend your maternity leave, you have to go for disability sometimes. You're not disabled. You're just pregnant. So there has to be something else you can call it. Or, you know, I just had a baby. So I'm not really disabled. I just am not at work. It's a very strange system we have. (laughs) (laughs) So you said that was kind of a turning point for you? Yeah. Um, After that, um, I I ended up getting hospitalized not soon thereafter, understandably, because I still was getting dehydrated. I still wasn't keeping much down. I lost another five pounds, I think, in a week. Um, So then I was 30 pounds down. I'm not like a very thin person. So, you know, but if in terms of beach bodies, I probably looked great. Um, but in terms of pregnancies, not so much. Yeah. <laughs> so I got hospitalized again. And at that point, my husband was like, I've had enough of this doctor. And it was very interesting to see him transition from somebody who really didn't know very much about pregnancy, about definitely about this condition and become so well-versed and really able to advocate for me when I couldn't do it myself. So he called up the doctor and said, I don't know what you're doing, but you need to talk to my wife because something is going on beyond just her needing to stay here for a few days and get rehydrated and nothing is working. And at that point too, one of the frustrations we were having was that we weren't really able to get in a hold of her. She had a very busy practice. So I would be in the hospital overnight and sort of expect to hear from her the next day or something. And I wouldn't hear from her at all. And I tried to call her office and get in touch with her. And I really didn't, I didn't have any sort of communication with what was going on. So the second time I was in the hospital, a doctor came up and said, hey, you've been approved for a midline. So we're going to go ahead and get that installed. (laughs) Like, sorry, what? (laughs) What would that mean? Um, So um, my husband, thankfully, uh, got a hold of her and said, we're definitely leaving your practice, but before we do that, you need to give us all the details about what's going to be happening now, what this midline is, what needs to be done, and then we're moving. I got what it basically is a permanent IV. It's a line that runs from your midarm up to around your shoulder through your vein. Um, it has to be installed in a hospital, and then from there you get, it will look like kind of like a little bag, um, and inside had uh, an IV infusion system and you would just, they would set it up via home nurse. They would set it up for me and it would just pump the Zofran directly into my veins so that I didn't have to keep taking the oral medication because at that point I wasn't keeping it down at all. Um, And that's, was when that sort of process happened. Um, We changed doctors after that um, to more family practice and much smaller Um, And we were with them for a few weeks. And then I had another kind of episode. Um, I had started losing a lot of weight again. I wasn't keeping anything down, even though I had the pump. And they hospitalized me again. And the doctor was really, he was amazing. And we were able to get in contact with him easily. But he said, at this point, you're moving into high risk. 
I think I was at about 14 or 15 weeks then. And he said at this point, I'm not comfortable having you continue here, but I have a lot of other kind of doctors who specialize in high-risk pregnancies, and I'd like you to go see one of them. And he was amazing and set us up with who ended up being our doctor going forward um, and took care of us with the line and everything else that came with it. So part of the problem with the midline is it's, even though it's supposed to be permanent, it kind of just like, it can just fall out. <laughs> it's just unbelievably gross. Um, you have to, uh, my do- my husband basically became my nurse. So he learned how to flush it and um, how all the tubing worked and how to reset the system and all of these jargon terms that I just was kind of too out of it to really understand all the time. He was amazing through all of this. I can't, I I was so lucky to have such an involved partner um, around who did this stuff for me. So, but it is gross and sometimes like it can cause a little bit of damage to the veins Um, over time. Your veins like kind of seize up Mm -hmm. um, and they get dried out. So yeah, so eventually um, I think at this point, was around Thanksgiving or so. I was with my current doctor and it fell out and I just had a breakdown because I knew that, okay, that means I've got to go back to the hospital. That means I have to figure it, they have to figure something else out and all these appointments. And I had just started back at work and I was looking forward to my first long weekend. My family was in town and I had just sort of another, I think, you know, totally reasonable breakdown. Yeah, I was about to say, like, I mean, so much of what you've said, and you're still just like barely out of the first trimester. Yes. And being your first baby, like, just how were you feeling? Like, this is obviously not how you viewed pregnancy going. No, no, I I don't think I, in my wildest dreams, I could not have imagined this. And I think um, the other thing I was struggling with was how much of this is just normal and how much of this is abnormal. And I'm getting told sometimes, especially by certain professionals, like, oh, but this is just pregnancy and I've never been pregnant before. So maybe this is just part of it. Um, And I would get really down in the dumps and I would have very dark moments. And it feels like it's sort of sucking the joy out of this thing that should be so exciting and joyful and this thing that I really wanted. I was so excited to have a baby, but I, I was miserable every day. I just couldn't reconcile the two. So I think what I ended up doing was just compartmentalizing. There was the condition that I was having right now, which was temporary, and there was my life with my baby. So whenever possible, I tried to, you know, look at ultrasound pictures. I tried to keep myself motivated. Like, this is this is what we're going for. Like, this is the end goal, but this other condition has to be handled separately. So, but it was it was really tough in the beginning, especially when a lot of stuff was just going completely wrong. And, you know, and, you know, not to be at work was really, really hard for me. I'm so used to just working and having that distraction. And when you're sitting home by yourself, (laughs) you know, nothing to do really, and you're not feeling great, you know, for weeks at a time, it's, it it gets in there. Yeah. Yeah. It feels like the longest weeks of your life, I'm sure. Yes. Yes. And then we had an election too somewhere in there. So I I was, yeah, I was going through it. I, anyone I know that was pregnant during that, I feel for so much. Oh my gosh, if that wasn't a total buzzkill, I don't know what was. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> oh, all right. Well, so what do you feel like was the next kind of stage that you want to talk about? <laughs> So then I got this really cool thing called a pick line, which is the midline, but it goes all the way to almost to one of your heart ventricles. Oh Don't gosh. quote me on that. Um, but the, so the only thing is you do have to take a, um, you do have to get an x-ray beforehand, which is why they wanted to wait until I was later in the pregnancy before they did anything like that. But um, she was fine. And they, right after the x-ray, they did an ultrasound the following week just to make sure. Um, so the great thing about that line is it's completely permanent. Like it, until you get it uninstalled, you, there's nothing, you know, no, there's no more, you know, vein shrinkage. And is what would happen is like after a week, my arm would be completely swollen with the midline. This one I could move. I could even, you know, I could go for walks. The bag didn't feel as much pulling and tugging, um, as it did before. So I just felt a lot freer. 
Um, and my doc, at that point I changed doctors. He arranged for the pick line to be installed. I had his cell phone number, email address, office number. He checked on me at least once a week. We had, you know, standing phone call appointments and he was just so available to me and I could kind of give all my health concerns onto him. And he, (laughs) you know, reassured me everything would be fine. He specialized, um, in high risk pregnancy. So he told me what it was going to look like going forward if, you know, best case scenario and worst case scenario. And it just was so good to be in the hands of someone who, you know, could give me that assurance. I had always pictured too, that I was going to have this very like kumbaya, natural pregnancy and birth experience. Uh, My friend had just gotten certified as a doula. I was going to go, you know, water birth the whole nine. And that's just not what happened. Um, so it was, but it was really good once we got in the care of somebody who actually cared and who was available to us. It just changed everything. So after that, I was back at work full time. I had a home nurse and he was the same one every week. So, um, and he was a lovely man who, you know, basically saw my bump grow from nothing to something over the course of my pregnancy. So that was kind of nice. Um, he got to know my dogs um, and it was great. And, So from there, it got a lot better. I still had episodes. I think I was hospitalized two more times after the pig line was installed. Just kind of the same thing. I would get very dehydrated after vomiting for a long time. It never really stopped for me. I never felt 100%. I would have, you know, a bite of something one day and the next day have the same thing and just be, you know, on the floor. And there was just no rhyme or reason to it. Um, and that's just the cards that were dealt. Um, were there any yeah. other side effects? Like, did your throat get, like, burned? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That No, that's totally true. Yeah, so, I uh, yeah, my throat felt, I always felt raw. I felt like I had, like, kind of, like, perpetual, like, scratchy throat. Um, it's, you know, it's, from what I've heard, it's similar to, like, uh, someone who suffers from bulimia. And some yeah, of those similar kind of things. Thinking about. Yeah, yeah, from what I've heard. Um, so they were really concerned about my teeth. Mm-hmm. Um, and what the, so I went to the dentist a little bit more frequently, which also made me sick. Oh, I'm <laughs> so, sure. So that was always an experience. Um, they also gave me um, intravenous uh, uh, vitamins. So, like, they would sometimes give me a bag that also had calcium or um, vitamin A or C or something like that so that at least I was getting, I suppose, what I needed when I wasn't able to keep anything down. Um, so, Were yeah. they checking the baby a lot more frequently than they normally would be as well? Yes. Um, I had an ultrasound every month. And when it was very bad, I think I was going in, like, twice a, once or twice. I guess every two weeks, I suppose. Um, but that didn't last too long. Um, she was doing fantastically through all this. Um, just and sucking you dry. <laughs> I mean, no, literally. That's what I they remember. Do. <laughs> <laughs> you when they come out. Um, and when uh, when I I remember going to one of the doctors that I ended up not staying with long, and he was like, I, you know, I'd asked him like, you know, what about me after all this? Like, am I just going to be this, you know, brittle bone kind of shell of a person? He's like, yeah, pretty much. Um, <laughs> if you do not get, you know, if we don't start to get you what you need, um, he's like, I've had women who their teeth just fall out, you know, <laughs> like they're, you know, or like their hair thins beyond just the normal, you know, post-pregnancy hair loss. Like it, it, you know, it can be, it can be kind of severe, but he's like, I haven't had a baby that's been affected yet. So it's amazing. They're in these little, it's like a superhero shell in there. Did you find any like groups on Facebook or anything like that to talk to other women? Um, The best I found was, um, there was like one, if you, if you Google like hyperemesis support group, there was like a forum of women, but they were, it was interesting because they were mostly in the UK and Europe. Um, but they, you know, the, the timing was always off. Like it was very, you know, there were very active times for like a month and then nobody would be around. Um, I mostly found a lot of comfort in my friends were amazing, even though none of them had kids or had been pregnant, but they were really understanding. My girlfriends took 
turns staying with me at the hospital when I had to be there for a couple of days. They were amazing. And my husband was great too. I mean, so I was fortunate. My parents came to town, I think every month and would just hang out and do dishes. So <laughs> so the times that you were able to go back to work, were you actually going into the office or working from home? Yep. Wow. I was going into the office with my, with my bag. Um, so I always had two bags, one, one purse and then my little IV bag and everybody knew about it. And I would show, <laughs> I would show oh my, my wounds to everyone because <laughs> whatever, who cares at this point, I've got no dignity left. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and it, you know, they were so understanding and I, I mean, I don't know what conversations were had behind my back, but they all seemed, you know, intrigued by what was going on and helpful when they could. So and I, you know, my job, it does require, I mean, a, a decent amount of overtime, but I had at least four people at my desk right at five, like, get out of here right now. Yeah. <laughs> Go home, <laughs> please. So that was really sweet. <laughs> That's great that you had a supportive work environment. That would have been just one yeah. more thing to deal with. If it happened. <sighs> I don't think I could have done one more thing. <laughs> right. So you, you mentioned you would want you had planned for a unmedicated birth. Did you get any pushback from your high risk doctor on birth plans at all, or how did that go? Um, my doctor, he was he was open. He said, you know, if you would like to have your friend who's a doula attend the birth, I'm fine with that. If you want to have an epidural, I'm fine with that. If you don't want to have an epidural, I'm fine with that. Um, but he did he insisted that. N- you know, when I said I'd like to do maybe a home birth, he was like, no. He said, I want you to be somewhere where I can monitor you really closely. And I'm not licensed to have your birth at your house. So <laughs> um, you will be having giving birth in a hospital. But otherwise, you can, you know, I'm happy to do whatever other plan you have. So did you feel pretty good about what you guys landed on? Um, it wasn't quite was what was expected. Um but that it was nothing that was anyone's fault. Um, mm-hmm. But I I really enjoyed the labor process. It it was actually in the same room. I was in the same room that I had been hospitalized in previously at that hospital. Oh, so you'd been in so, labor and delivery for that? Yeah. So well, it was like kind of they had a little separate area for labor, and then they brought you into a separate wing for delivery. Oh. So the labor room, I, I was. I'd been there before, so I felt pretty comfortable in that room. Um, <laughs> I actually had some similar nurses. Some of the nurses popped up again, so it was sort of like a little homecoming, and everybody was really excited that I wasn't there to throw up. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, let's yeah. go ahead and get into that birth story then. Yeah, um, so I went into the doctor for, oh, I was at 39 weeks. Um, and I went in for my normal checkup and he noticed that my heart rate was a little elevated. And I dealt with that a lot throughout the pregnancy. My blood pressure would rise and my heart rate would rise and usually was related to nausea happening. So most of the time he just sort of let it go. Um, but this time I wasn't feeling nauseous. Um, I was fine and I, you know, just still, he, you know, tested it, gave me an hour. I hung out the office, tried it again. It's still it was really high. Um, so he said, go in to the hospital and they'll just monitor you. You'll probably be gone in an hour and you can go home and enjoy the rest of your Friday. Um, and an hour later they tried it still a little high. They tried it again an hour after that, still a little high. Um, and at that point they said, we're just going to call your doctor and just kind of see what his thoughts are. And he pretty much got on the phone and was like, you're pretty sick of being pregnant. At that point, I'd asked him, what are all of the things I could do to make this baby come out <laughs> at any time? Because he had told me, you know, you have the all clear. Um, so he was like, yeah, if you're OK with it, I have I think we should induce you because your heart rate is really climbing quite a lot. And you don't usually have a high heart rate like this. Um, so I would be more comfortable inducing you and getting this process started. You're already effaced. You might have your baby tomorrow morning. I think we were at like 5 p.m. by then. So I said, okay, yeah, if, if that's what you think is best, I'm okay with it. And I called, you know, my best friend who's, you know, studying to be a doula. I called my husband and we were induced at 9 p.m. And that's, nothing happened. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Um, nothing happened. And, and they were tracking my contractions and they're like, these are 
you're, you know, you're doing great. How are you feeling? I didn't feel much. I felt fine. And they checked me in the morning and I was one centimeter (laughs) and they checked me in the afternoon. So now we're into like Saturday 12 or so. And I was two centimeters. So (laughs) it just was not progressing at all, which I think might be part of the induction process anyways. So we hung out, we had pizza, (laughs) we played cards, we watched TV and, you know, I just sort of labored away. Um, it got to be probably around 4 p.m. ish. It might have even been a little bit earlier. Um, and my doctor was in and out the whole time. You know, he, I think he played a game of cards with us. Like, you know, we were just really mellow. Um, and we had friends come in. <laughs> um, and, you know, he's like, well, nothing's happening. So I wanted to do a balloon and um, just to try to, you know, open up the cervix some more and see if we can get this progressing and move you into active labor. Cause at that point, I didn't even think I really was in active labor. I mean, I felt contractions, but it just, it just kind of felt like a period cramp to me. So they inserted this balloon that they filled. I don't know how nitty gritty I should get with this. There's no TMI here. So <laughs> as much as you want to share is fine. So I, I feel like it's really important that people know about the balloon. Nobody had told me about I it. I agree. <laughs> Tell us everything. <laughs> okay. So they, they take the, I said to him, you know, listen, I just want to know if this is, you're telling me balloon. I think it's going to be a clown balloon. Like, are you going to come out with like a giraffe or something? Like, what are you putting in there? And he's, he's like, no, I promise. It's, it's, they showed me the balloon, you know, you, we're going to insert it in you, which you won't feel at all. And then we'll fill it up with saline, like a saline solution. Um, and we'll do it slowly. So it's just going to be a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. And then, you know, over the next, you know, five to 10 hours, depending, we just, the goal is just for the balloon to fall out on its own because you've begun to open your cervix enough. So, okay. All right, fine. So they insert this balloon and, and no, it's, it's much more like a clown balloon than like a little thin balloon that I was shown. Um, but you know, it wasn't too bad, but at that point I felt, I started to really sort of feel it. And I really, like I said, I wasn't looking to go have a medicated birth. I was trying to avoid an epidural, but I think we're, we're coming up on 14 hours then of just, you know, this kind of persistent labor. And after the balloon was installed, it did push things a little bit more severely for me. Um, And my doctor was, I, you know, I had my friends there and I was, they were telling me like, you know, do you feel like you want an epidural? How are you feeling? And um, I had told everyone like, you can ask me once, but don't ask me, you know, 20 times because then I'm going to get it, give in. So they, this was their one time to ask. And I sort of was like, well, I didn't expect to be here this long and this is starting to get pretty painful and also this balloon really hurts bad. <laughs> um this yeah this is not and they're saying that this is going to be another five to ten hours just of balloon time um and then maybe we'll go into something so I yeah I just gave up the goat and went ahead and got the epidural um and it, I, it wasn't that bad. And my doctor, I think at one point said to me, you know, he said, and I thought it was really good to hear. He said, this isn't a competition. (laughs) You know, you don't have to try to have the most unmedicated birth. You just do what's right for you. So if you're, you know, you've had enough of the pain, please go ahead and get epidural. (laughs) I said, that makes sense to me. Um, so we did the epidural. I think we're at about I think maybe 15, 16 hours then, um, and just kind of continued to labor away. And sometime around midnight on Sunday, they removed the balloon and they were like, you're looking great. You're, you know, you're at five centimeters, your water's broken. We're moving you into the delivery room. Fantastic. Right. Like, yay, I'm going to to have the baby and (laughs) nothing. (laughs) Nothing, nothing, nothing. Had they done was, any other induction, like pito- Pitocin or anything? Yes. They had been, they'd been giving me steady drips of Pitocin um, throughout the stay. They had, he had stripped, actually stripped my membranes um, before they induced me, I guess. 
Mm -hmm. And so, and then it's around midnight was when my water broke, maybe, maybe from the balloon, maybe naturally. Um, I'm not really sure. And, you know, I'm at five centimeters now and they're thinking like, okay, this is, and my contractions are very strong. They're telling me Uh, they're, you know, super strong. You should be progressing a lot at this point. We expect for you to have this baby in the morning and nothing. (laughs) And, um, my husband at this point is we've, you know, we've all been wearing the same clothes for almost two days, (laughs) more than two days. We're tired. We're getting a little delirious. All of the games are not really working anymore. And, you know, we're just kind of trying to figure out what the next steps are. And obviously now that my water's broken, there's, there's time. Um, so the doctor came in around 3 a.m., and he said, I just want to, you know, be upfront with you. We, we've talked about what happens with the C-section. He had really given me quite a lot of information about all the different interventions that could happen, although he never told me about the balloon. And I did call him on that for later on. But, um, you know, he said, you know, so we've talked about what this would look like. I think we're moving into that category. We're, we're getting to that point um, because, you know, the baby's heart rate is starting to raise. Um, so we're worried that she might be in a little bit of distress. Um, I'm going to check you in about an hour or two and we can make our decision from there. But if it, he's, you know, basically told me that if it's going into 7 a.m., it's, it's kind of not going to be a choice at that point. So he checked me again and he said that her head was, she was actually in full position. She was on my cervix, but there wasn't enough room for her to come out and her head was starting to bunch. So I guess the skin of her skull, he could see it was starting to bunch. He could feel it. And he said at that point, you might, you know, it can cause some deformities if we try to push her through or, you know, he said, I know you don't want to use forceps, anything like that vacuum. He's like, you're not even open enough for that to happen anyway. So C-section it was. So I called my mother who was in Michigan and panicking. Um, and I said, I think you're gonna have to come a little bit early because I might need your help. And yeah, we cried. I was scared for my kid. And also somewhere around that time, they stopped giving me Zofran and I started throwing up again. So <laughs> oh my I was a mess. <laughs> I'm like just picturing yourself lying there being cut open and heaving. It just doesn't yes, yes, seem like that's it would work. Pretty much. That's pretty much what would happen. So, you know, before the C-section, they give you a drink that they say will calm your stomach. And I said, listen, I really don't think I should have this drink. I, I my stomach's not going to be calm. <laughs> and they were, you know, insisted, oh, yeah, no, take the, take the drink. It'll help. And um, they like, wheeled me into the... My stomach hates me. <laughs> it's been nine months of my stomach hating me. I just don't think that this crazy orange drink is going to be the thing that really makes it happy again. It wasn't. Um, they wheeled me into the operating room and I tried to yell before I did, but I just threw up everywhere. Um, and my husband came in and he was so excited and he's got his scrubs on and they just passed him the cup and I threw up through the entire C-section and then a little bit after. Um, but the C-section went really well. Um, she came out, you know, she was so tiny. She was only five pounds and 15 ounces. So she was just a little thing, um, causing all this ruckus. And she came out screaming and eyes completely open. And (laughs) I threw up one last time (laughs) after I saw her and that was it. Um, and everything was great after that. Oh my gosh. So great. (laughs) So how was the postpartum stay at the hospital? Um, it was so much better than any other hospital stay I had ever had. Um, you know, we'd stayed there before. We actually were, we got to be in the postnatal unit before. So we did meet, again, other nurses, which was great, that we'd already been in contact with. I was just so in love with this baby and so in love with not being pregnant. <laughs> I was the happiest new mom that you would ever meet. I didn't care that I was in a lot of pain and that I, you know, the bathroom thing didn't bother me. I was so, I was in bliss. I ate 
turkey sandwiches and all the soup that I wanted to have. And I, you know, every person who came in brought, you know, cinnamon rolls or whatever other thing that I hadn't been able to eat and just enjoyed our baby. And we, you know, we didn't have any complications with the C-section, thankfully. It was pretty routine. We were out, I guess we gave birth on Sunday morning and we were out Tuesday afternoon. Again, my best friends came and sat with me at the hospital and the, until my parents came into town. Um, yeah, it was it was totally fine. I mean, I, you know, I probably the most difficult part was the breastfeeding while, you know, tending to the C-section wound while in the hospital was a little cumbersome. But my milk came in pretty quickly um, and I didn't have too many challenges besides the discomfort of adjusting to breastfeeding. That's so crazy that the relief was so immediate with being able to just all of a sudden eat. (laughs) (laughs) They wheeled me into, the the big thing was I would have cravings, but it would always come with nausea, like even as I was thinking about it. So I would have these very strong cravings for like a chicken sandwich and I would always feel nauseous just even thinking about a chicken sandwich, right? So um, (laughs) when I got out of, they bring you into like a recovery room um, where they monitor you with like no baby and you, you know, my husband came in with me and I took a long nap and I woke up and I said, I want a hot dog. And I didn't feel any nausea. And I, I was <laughs> giddy. <laughs> I said, this is the best thing ever. <laughs> I said, I'm just, I just sat there and named off foods that I wanted to eat and just enjoyed not feeling sick thinking about them. <laughs> it was incredible. <laughs> That's awesome. I like that's a total New York girl, too, to be like, bring me a hot dog. <laughs> I know. I, very, very New York girl. Yeah. Oh, gosh, it was fantastic. And then, you know, I just wanted to see that little bean. I was just obsessed with her. So She's so oh, cute. Yeah. I was looking at the pictures you sent over, all that hair. <laughs> yes. Like, maybe that's what caused all I that. I know. And in my moment. <laughs> Stomach trouble. I know that's totally not true. But, but in my moment pretty, of, pretty. like, uh, high medication, I did asked the doctor, like, okay, you've kind of been fishing around in there. Do you feel hair? Does she have any hair? And he's like, what? <laughs> Maybe that's just the medication I'm talking. She has, like, almost like a it's wig. In, like she so had, like, a pixie hair. cut when she came out, and she's got yeah, triple that so now. Cute. It's crazy. Oh yeah, God. she's, she's so, so cute. cute. We're just torturing people because of the podcast, <laughs> but they'll have to go to the show notes page yes. and, and look at her because she's so Check sweet. her out. Well, do you have any resources that you want to share that were helpful to you? Um, you know, Google was amazing. Yeah. <laughs> Google, 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 um, your, you know, your own instincts. Um, I did really like, I think I had one of those Ovia apps or, you know, kind mm-hmm. of one of those. Tracks yeah, things. that was really helpful for me just when I was in my feelings more to keep me, you know, motivated about. Yeah, because you can track emotional and yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is nice. You're like, probably felt good to punch <laughs> that button and be like, I am pissed off today. <laughs> they need to make a button that's green for vomiting, but um, yeah. otherwise, yeah, it was nice to be able to kind of log. <laughs> this is this is what I'm going through right now. Um, I'm trying to think of any other, like, good baby ones. If you can find the the site yeah. that, you mentioned that was I'll send the link for um, other mamas, yeah, I'll list that. Yeah. I'm sure people that are going through it would like to yeah. be able to connect. Yeah. With moms. yeah, yeah. And I think I mean, I've been told that there are support groups, um, but I didn't find any that were close to me. Um right. you know, that were, you know, reasonable distance. But I feel like there should be something like that. Maybe I'll make one now that I'm better. But. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So how do you feel about getting pregnant again? Terrible. Oh, my gosh. I yeah. mean, golly. That's so rough. <laughs> and it's it's pretty common for it to happen. With pretty much. Um, yeah, right? my doctor told me I would have double chance that it would happen again. Um, you lessen your chance mm-hmm. if you get a new baby daddy. So, <laughs> <laughs> what did the doctor tell he you? He did. That? He said, "Don't tell your husband, but it does go back to normal if you." <laughs> I immediately told my husband. He said, "Absolutely not." <laughs> I'm sure that made him feel good. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, it's your fault. <laughs> it's all his fault. <laughs> I think of it like um, 
you know, uh, Captain Planet, when our powers combine, it's yes. terrible. <laughs> oh but gosh. we make cute babies, so he is ready for another already. Oh, my gosh. My only major birth plan was to have my birth control installed as soon as possible after giving birth. Yeah. So it's not happening right <laughs> now. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it seems like your body would just need more time to recover, yeah. too. Yeah, yeah, from... from Replenish a, all of those nutrients Yeah, and I needed to see if my teeth would stay. I needed to do yeah. a lot of stuff. Oh, my stuff. gosh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my so gosh. So we're all good. Our teeth are all accounted for. Mild <laughs> gingivitis, but it's okay, <laughs> you know? Um, oh, my gosh. So, I, yeah, I mean, my doctor said, be ready for, you know, a good... 12 month recovery to get over the hyperemesis and then also to get over your C-section and all the other parts of birth that you also experience. So for now right. I'm, I'm cool with pressing pause and you know, if I start to forget, then maybe we can start to think about it. <laughs> oh gosh. It just, oh, I don't man. know. Talk to me in three years. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's been so good talking to you. I love your, you know, sense of humor around all of this. I know it was miserable, but I guess that was probably a way to help you get through yeah, it. Yeah, um, yeah. Trying to stay somewhat lighthearted in between complete meltdowns, <laughs> yes. which were totally understandable. Yeah, well. yeah. And if anybody else is suffering from it, it, you know, allow yourself to have those breakdowns and don't be too hard on yourself. Don't, you know, let if, yeah, so what? You're having a baby. You're miserable. Just embrace it it is what it is yeah (laughs) yeah I agree well Desiree did you want to share where people can connect with you um yeah I have uh Instagram I'm at Desi Alicia D-E-S-I-E Alicia A-L-I-C-I-A and then that also links to my Facebook I think so that's pretty much it all right perfect well we'll put that on the show notes page so people can find you there and just thank you again so much for sharing your story with us thank you so much for letting me speak to you it was so cathartic (laughs) Oh, good. (laughs) Not like rehashing everything. No, it felt really good. (laughs) Awesome. Okay, now I'm going to chat with Kate about Aeroflow breast pumps and getting your breast pump for free through insurance, as well as their free lactation classes that you can sign up for and your insurance will cover. Let's chat with Kate. Hi, Kate. Thanks so much for coming on the birth hour today to chat with me about Aeroflow breast pumps. Yay. Hi, Bryn. Happy to be here. Awesome. Well, you reached out via Instagram about Aeroflow and your experience with them, and I was so excited to talk with you. So will you just tell people a little bit about, you know, how you found Aeroflow and the process you went through for using their services? Yeah, for sure. So it was actually through the birth hour, um, through your podcast that I heard about Aeroflow um, and decided to just fill out the form. It's like a very simple form you fill out online Mm -hmm. um, where you put in your insurance information and then like Aeroflow does the rest. Yeah. Um, And so they got me a free breast pump. Um, I think it was the Spectra is the one that was um, the one I chose through insurance, but Aeroflow will actually show you like all of the different pumps available to you, um, how much they cost through insurance. Some of them, like you do have to pay a little bit um, and then they show you the ones that are fully covered um, and so I just, I decided, yeah, I chose the Spectra um, and they sent it to me. And then I think I got like an email or a text that said like, hey, thanks for, you know, using Aeroflow. You should also sign up for um, our lactation classes. And, you know, I, you get tons of those sort of promotional emails. Right. And I didn't like think much of it. I was like, okay, whatever. I'll, I'll take a look at this later. Um, and then I like started looking more into it and I was like, oh, actually these classes look pretty cool. They were fully virtual and they were covered by insurance. And so I decided, you know, I was like, what the heck, let's do it. And I signed up for, I think, four different classes. Um, I only made it to two of them, but the two that I went to were lactation 101 and um, pumping 101. And they were, they're just like such great classes. I was like so surprised by the the quality of the classes. They're taught by, um, is it IB? IBCLC. Yeah. And they like just gave a ton of good information about like starting breastfeeding off right. And so it was, it also would be helpful too for people who are newly breastfeeding, like just kind of um, work through some like, you know, potential breastfeeding issues like latching or positioning. But yeah, I contribute a lot to my um, success. So my daughter is four weeks old now. um, And we had a pretty 
solid start to breastfeeding. Um, I've been exclusively breastfeeding and I contribute a lot of it to the having that support from the class. Um, the way the classes run too, are they're live. Oh, cool. That was going to be my next question. <laughs> yeah. They're, so they're virtual. Um, so you can learn via Zoom. Yeah. But they're live. And so the instructor is there t- like teaching the course. They're also really um, just like super good teachers. Like I felt like they were, the way they presented mm. information was really good. They had tons of like visuals and videos, um, like live demonstrations where they have like a baby doll and they were showing um, different like positions and ways to get ready to latch. Mm-hmm. And so the, they are live though. So you can ask questions. And so you're able to like ask questions in the chat. You can, <clears throat> excuse me, unmute and like have a conversation back and forth. So um, very like helpful for like if you have specific questions too about lactation. Yeah, that sounds amazing. Especially like you said, like even after baby arrives to be able to like look at the positioning of the baby doll and like position your own baby on screen and be like, you know, like this or that's great. Yeah, it's really helpful. And like the pumping 101, like I had never, this is my first baby and I had never pumped before. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I got, I have the same pump that they were using in the demo, the Spectra. Oh, nice. And so it was really cool to get, I kind of like walked along with, you know, like did the demo along with them um, on the same pump, uh, which was just really helpful having never used a breast pump before. Yeah. They look kind of scary um at least to me they looked really scary and so it was nice to like be able to sort of walk through with um with the the instructor and get a demo so when you were signing up for it was the scheduling were there like several a month or like lots of options or yeah that's a good question um it was pretty convenient um they gave a few times a month I want to say um and like different, I want to say they were like different hours too. Okay. Um, but it was like scheduling was really, really easy. Um, I remember like, cause you, they have, you know, all your information, like they have insurance information already. And so they do all the back end work of, right. of clearing the insurance. Cause they are, they're, you know, classes run by professionals and they do cost money, but insurance covers the cost. And so, um, they would like take attendance at the beginning of the zoom call um, and then they did like all that back end work to make sure it was covered by insurance. And so I didn't have to do anything except like put in my name and email to sign up. So yeah, like really easy. Awesome. And again, like kind of going into it, I was like, oh, you know, I'll give this a try, kind of see yeah. what it's like. And then I was just like captivated. I remember after the call, getting off a particularly the lactation 101 call um, and just like being like to my partner, like, oh my gosh, you've got to hear like, what I learned. Oh, cool. Like I, he was like, wow, you, you see like, you're like an expert now in lactation. I was like, I, I feel like it. Like, I feel like I'm like, have a lot of good, <laughs> um, solid information. So yeah, it's like super pleasantly surprised by how, um, informative and just helpful the classes were. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. I think that I had posted about Aeroflow on Instagram and you responded like their mm-hmm. classes are amazing. And so I knew you were passionate about it enough to like respond to an Instagram story. Yeah. So that's very cool. And I knew they had lactation education, but I wasn't fully aware of the mm-hmm. format and everything and the fact that they're live. I mean, that's like having your own, you know, virtual lactation consultant. So that's amazing. And I had taken like a childbirth ed class, um, mm-hmm. paid for, like it was a community one that I paid for here. And I live in Minneapolis and, mm-hmm. and it was, like we went over one of the weeks we went over lactation and it was like similar information, Mm -hmm. but like free, you know, like I was like, and it it also like some, it was kind of went more in depth um, because the Aeroflow class was specifically a lactation class, like the lactation 101 class, what I'm thinking of. Um, So yeah, it was just like, very quality, like good information. Awesome. Yeah. I'm going to add this definitely to our resources on the website and our childbirth course. Cause we go over a lot of that stuff as well, but the live aspect I think is just so great. Even if it's a refresher for, you know, mm-hmm. second or third time, or you already took a class, just something to kind of get a refresher and ask questions and things like that. So, and there are some um, other classes, like the other ones I signed up for, but didn't end up making um, there was like one on like maternity leave, mm. um, like, and your, um, kind of like, I think lactation stuff around, um, leave and like going back to work. And, um, right. But yeah, they were all covered through insurance. So very cool. Well, I'm going to have to reach out to Aeroflow and audit these classes so that <laughs> I can talk about it more as well. But thank you so much for shining a spotlight on it. Yeah, for sure. 
Highly recommend. So don't, when you get that email or that text that says, hey, do you want to also sign up for the classes? <laughs> you should do it because I was, I, like I said, I was kind of like, oh, yeah, okay, whatever, like promotional email for right. Airflow, but Right. And we're all paying so much for insurance. Like we might as well get as much out of it as we can. Totally. It was well worth it. Awesome. Well, thank you so much again, Kate. Yeah, of course, Bren. Thanks so much for having me on. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, head to thebirthhour.com and click become a member to pledge your support. And as a thank you, you'll get an invitation to join our private Facebook group and access to exclusive episodes. Your vote of confidence and support means the world to me.